Welcome to the place where we gain knowledge through the lens of creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Artful Science. Thanks again for joining me here on Artful Science. Today's show is Clickbait, the science driving human use of computers. And my guest is Ben Schneiderman, who is Distinguished University Professor in the Department of Computer Science, founding director of the Human Computer Interaction Laboratory, and a member of the Institute for Advanced Computer Studies at the University of Maryland College Park. Ben, welcome to the show. Thank you, Aaron. Glad to be here. Cool. And hopefully I did okay with all of your titles there. <laughs> yeah, so, sure. Uh, so, you know, I thought I would just dive right in. Um, you know, so, you know, from my perspective, you are one of, you know, these brilliant people who not only <laughs> understand, um, but actually create some of these day-to-day -day things that we all use, but you have actually created. Um, so of course, every day we all end up clicking on tons and tons of links. And I think we always look back and say, well, that was just always the case. Um, but could you kind of just share a little history about these links that we click? Um, and also as part of that kind of what this direct manipulation concept is. Great, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I've been working on these ideas for a long time. My background's computer science, but I became 20% of an experimental psychologist in trying to study the way people use technology. And to do that, I was a designer and developer of various uh, uh, early interfaces in the 1970s, 1980s, as personal computers were getting going. And around 1984, 85, we were working on an electronic encyclopedia idea. And uh, this was before the internet, of course, and we're working to connect up ideas and the notion of hypertext had been around for a long time uh, and uh, even the notion of a link, but they were always clumsy. You had to type numbers or codes or do something. And um, I thought, hey, <laughs> look at that. The word I want is right there. I wanna know what Aaron Dworkin's about. And I just click on Aaron Dworkin and I get a biography and a photo and a story and I know where I'm going. So the idea of actually the words themselves became clickable objects was that aha moment. And it took a, you know, a week to get grad student <laughs> uh, Daniel, right. Daniel Ostroff to implement it. And we had a working system. And from there, of course, it took years to polished the idea and there were a lot of features and aspects. What color should it be? We tried red and red was bright. It caught people's attention and they, they could spot the links, but they did not remember the content of the page as well. And the light blue that we chose was a good balance because it was still visible, but it did not interfere with the reading. And we showed that at various places and Tim Berners-Lee was one of our colleagues and he saw that and in his spring 1989 manifesto for the web, he cited our work as the source of that. We had worked with a company, Cognetics and a dear friend, Charlie Kreitzberg to create a commercial product, which was on a single computer. But <clears throat> Tim Berners-Lee's innovation was to allow you to click on a link on your machine and get stuff from around the world. That was pretty amazing. That was pretty eye-opening and you know, mind, mind expanding. And it was a very powerful idea. So we had a small role, but sometimes little ideas have very powerful impacts. It's, it's really amazing and how just an idea literally leads to something that is just so ubiquitous. It's, it's really extraordinary. So, you know, we but all, you asked, oh yeah, yeah. You asked about direct manipulation. Yes, yes. And yes, the particular idea is, you know, a, a, a significant point, but somehow you have to lay the foundation. You have to build the soil and, and fertilize it and enrich it with nutrients in order for the plant to sprout. 
And the idea of direct manipulation had emerged three or four or five years earlier in the early 1980s, 81, as, we began, as I began to notice specific systems that were especially loved by their users. I mean, things like, and that were effective like air traffic control systems and certain games and certain simulations and uh, various tools. And they were all characterized with, with what became known as the graphical user interface. There were objects and actions on the screen and you can click and drag and do hover over them. And that, that seemed to really make it come alive rather than reading text and then typing some numbers right. or typing some commands as was the command line strategy right. yeah. of the day. And so the idea of clicking and dragging grew and grew and grew in my mind and I began to see the ways to apply it. And one of them was that obvious aha moment when I thought, oh, there's a name on a screen I just want to click on it. I don't want to have to type the name or type a command, you know, or retrieve Aaron Dworkin. You don't want to have to type all that. You just want to click. And clicking and tactile were physical things that were good, even better than voice, it turned out. Right. But you really just want to touch stuff, you know? And that's why you want to have your phone and you want to touch it. And we began to develop touchscreen keyboards for home automation and Right. other uses and the touch stuff was also an application of direct manipulation directly manipulate the objects on the screen and the objects were also actions so a trash can was a natural thing you want to delete something you don't type delete you drag the file into it and you hear clunk and it arrives the and it can lights up and you know what happened. Right. And it's so amazing. And, and also built in the feedback of exactly the clunk. It's now in the garbage. I know it. I, I have received feedback that I have achieved uh, putting something in the trash. It's really amazing. And I kind of want to go a little deeper into that. And, you know, because we all interact, right? You just raised something I never, ever think about. But that idea that I drag something to the trash versus type delete to delete it. Um, and so there's clearly this science that drives our interaction with computers. And back in 86, you wrote in some ways, right, this defining book on it, Designing the User Interface, Strategies for Effective Human-Computer Interaction. And of course, there's been many editions since then. And as part of that, you kind of have these eight golden rules of interface design. And obviously, unfortunately, we don't have time to get into all those, but I was wondering if you could share just one or two of what you sure, see as sure. kind of these guideposts for yeah. how we interact. Yeah, my, my first book was 1980 called Software Psychology, my first book on this topic anyway. And that was a wild idea. And I was beginning to become, as I said, 20% of an experimental psychologist and thinking about design. So software psychology got me going. And then the field began to emerge. In 1982, I and some others founded a conference on, we call it Human Factors and Computer Systems, which continues today with 4,000 people a year. And the field of human computer interaction um, was, was launched. So by 86, I, there was enough going on. <laughs> I wanted to tell the story of this research community that had been, been building. And that sort of got it going. And that book was defining the research frontier. And over the 30 years since then, more than that, its books grown and I now have five co-authors and because it's, it, and it, it's moved away from the research frontiers closer to the practice. And so the idea of having practical rules was a strong part of it. And people kept pushing me, but can't you just, don't give me a, to 400 page book, give me right. you know, exactly. 10, 10 guidelines or eight. So exactly. I came up with this exactly. playful idea of the eight golden rules of user. Awesome, design. awesome. And for a show like ours, maybe even just one or two. <laughs> so, you know, the first one is strive, strive for consistency, uh, that you should have consistent. And one of the things was just the consistent labels and buttons and terminology on the screen and the dialogue boxes, the colors and the shapes should all be, there's always okay and cancel in the same position in the dialogue box. And having that 
set didn't really happen till Windows 95 or 97, really. Uh, it took a while because the inconsistencies were everywhere. Another was called Prevent Errors. And in the early version of that, it was make it easy to fix errors. But it became clear to me that the goal of good design was to prevent errors. And so you see the transformation in practical ways, like if you're making an airline reservation, when we get back to making airline reservations, instead of typing in MMDDYY, the month, the day, and the year that you want to fly, when, and then having as a programmer to write 30 different error messages, you just show a calendar and you click on the date and you're done, direct manipulation. Gotcha. And so it also led to, led to preventing errors as one of the, as one of the key of those. Uh, wow. And so in some ways, right, that's kind of this, this pretty basic direct thing, obviously a calendar. And so I am being directed, I'm being manipulated to choose things in the right way and not have errors. As we've now, as these processes have become so complex, do you fear or do you think that, that companies uh, and or scientists are creating systems and using that manipulation in ways that either we're unaware of or that cause concern at all? Yeah, you've turned it around to the dark side of, of direct manipulation, which is you may be directly manipulated by those who are designing the programs. And that is something that, uh, that has emerged and there's a real threat and a danger uh, that uh, you know, the likes of Facebook are manipulating you to get you to click more. You titled this session clickbait, which rattled me a bit, but I thought I'll go with it. Uh, but uh, yeah, we don't want a world where clickbait is dropped in front of us. We want a world where we control what's happening, that if we don't want clickbait, we can turn it off. If we don't want misinformation and fake news, we can stop it. If we wanna preserve our privacy, we can do that. Right. And that's really the cause that we're all fighting for now is to regain control over the environment um, that you know should have been, that was in our control in our world, but the powerful forces and I guess Shoshana Zuboff's Surveillance Capitalism uh, is maybe the most remarkable book that describes the, the ways in which uh, companies we respect and appreciate and use like Google and Facebook have also a dark side to them. And they are building in strategies that will get you to stay longer, to click more, you to buy more, but uh, and to attend to things, and that, in turn, they didn't expect it either. But that's been used by people with malicious intent, from criminals to scammers and spammers to terrorists and hate groups, and that is right now. I mean, that is, I would say, our number one concern. Um, we need to fix that problem, and it's fixable. Uh, but the incentives need to be put in place for the companies to make that happen. And, you know, they always push back against government regulation, but government regulation can be a good thing too. And we may need more of that. And the recent uh, antitrust case against Google, uh, and as you know, is an indication of some effort, not regulation, but trying to rein in uh, the, the, the powerful um, companies that have come to dominate the field. So we need greater diversity. We need more human control. <laughs> That's the thing. We want to give people the power. Power yeah. is in your hands. So Absolutely. Well, this is extraordinary. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time, but I always like to ask my guests, since we are at this cross section of the arts and sciences, do you have any arts that you actually practice yourself or arts sure. that you love appreciating? Well, I'm a big photography uh, photographer <laughs> and uh, my uncle was the legendary photographer, David Seymour, known as Shim. And I was inspired by him and his form of photojournalism. And so I've done that and done books. There's a nice little book about uh, photo history and 
uh, encounters with HCI pioneers of photo histories. I, I put in the story of my field through the 40 years of photographs from conferences and from the 60 leading people or 60 of the leading people in the field. So that's one place. But I also, I do have a strong visual arts and artistic view. And so there's my tree map art project, which you can find on the web where I, I'm the creator of a technique called tree mapping, uh, which is a visual representation of, of voluminous data sets used a lot by New York Times, by out of all kinds of journalistic places, but tree maps are an important idea, but people thought they looked pretty. So I said, okay. And I made 12 tree maps out of real data that show real things like business success and music's uh, usage. And I used the color palettes from Mondrian, from Hans Hoffman, from uh, other artists uh, at Gene Davis and uh, their style and I showed the data using that. And those 12, um, those pieces of art are hanging not only at the University of Maryland, but in the National Academy of Sciences, and they're part of the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So is... tree maps are my contribution uh, to a visual world. I think the future has more of that. I think the bridge, and I've worked hard about bridging arts and sciences, engineering and design, and uh, I still believe that's a virtuous, positive direction. It's after all Steve Jobs who said, you know, that Apple lives and works at the intersection of technology and liberal arts or humanities. And yeah. I think he got that right. And I think we need to see that bridging happen uh, more often. And I think we'll see it, you know, because now the tools are opening up and more available and more capable for a wider range of people to use the technology. I mean, creativity support tools, the notion I strongly advocate, it makes more people more creative more often. That's what we want to do. And that creativity will flow out in you know, a future that of, of, of computer systems that are more interactive, okay? They're more visual and they're more social. That's where we're going. Wow. Interactive, visual, and social. This is more screen space, well used and well designed. Your productivity and creativity is more or less linear with the number of pixels on your desktop. <laughs> this is truly extraordinary. I cannot thank you enough, not only for sharing your time on the show, but of course, for literally the extraordinary legacy and impact you're having on all of our lives, literally on a moment to moment, day to day basis. Ben Schneiderman, thank you for helping us gain knowledge through the lens of creativity here on Artful Science. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you.